cool. So today on On The Move, this will be episode 36 now, I believe. And uh, we're joined today by Buster McCleary, who uh, right now you're in Hawaii, which was uh, when we talked on the phone, that was not where I was expecting you to be <laughs> um, when we were trying to work out a time to record this. Yeah, there's a little little time difference between here and the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Well, and you're um, you're out there for a good little while, aren't you? You said several weeks. You're out yeah, there. we're gonna be here about three weeks. Okay. We're uh, good deal. We're working with some yearling colts, and we started a little handful of two year olds, and then we're riding some three year olds that we started last year. So we we've got okay. I don't know thirty six seven head horses up here. We're aggravating a little every day. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. And um, so this has been kind of a regular thing for you, going to Hawaii like this? Yeah, we came the first time in it was 2018 or 19. And we come come once or twice a year. Uh, we just came once during all the China virus doing, but uh, this this last year I came twice. And we're figuring on it again this year. Awesome, man. Well, that's good work if you can get it, I suppose. It's a um, yeah, pretty pretty historic old ranch, so I enjoy coming over here and seeing part of yeah. it. What, if you don't mind me asking, what ranch is it? it? It's the Parker Ranch here on the Big Island. Okay, cool. I've I've heard only a little bit about that, but I'm not terribly familiar. Yeah, it started in 1847. Wow. Yeah, That's Buster and I, when we were just visiting for a minute before we started the podcast, I was like, wow, I... I bet when you first got riding horses, you didn't think it was going to take you to Hawaii or some of these other places around the world. It's not really the normal trajectory of a career like that. No, I, I was telling Ben that you know, I was raised out there in West Texas, and I, I never got more than 200 miles from home, I don't guess, till I got to work with all these horses. But horses have enabled me to see 49 of the 50 states. That's quite a deal for cow punchers in West Texas. Wow, that's awesome. What's that uh, 50th state? I hadn't been to Alaska. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, if anybody's in Alaska is listening right now and you guys host clinics up there, put that put Buster on your radar so we can get him his last state there. <laughs> <laughs> What's... um. What's the P on your hat? It's the uh, ranch brand for Parker Ranch. Okay, cool. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah, but it's a P, and it kind of has a little tail on the top of the P there. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. That's neat, man. Yeah, he said he finally gave in to wearing ball caps because of the the wind out there. Yeah, last last five or six days, wind's been blowing from forty to sixty miles an hour, just straight winds day and night. And, and I guess it blew up this rain because it's been raining straight down all that day. And all that stuff's kind of hard on a straw hat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that must be some serious wind if it's uh, making the guy from West Texas change his mind about the hats because there's some pretty serious wind in West Texas, if I can remember. There, like there a couple is. times I've been out there. Uh, on rare occasion, I, I succumb to wearing a ball cap. It has to be blowing pretty hard man. This went on for about three days, and I finally said, I, well, I rode through a gate and looked back to one side, and, and uh, it almost blew my sunglasses off my face. So, I, well, it's, it's time to do something different. <laughs> there you go. But these the braking pins are kind of right between two big mountains, so it kind of funnels the wind through here uh, off the east coast. All, all the trees here, sense. all the trees here lean to the kind of the southwest. It, it blows a lot here. Hmm. So when you're heading out there, Buster, do you pack all your tack with you on the airplane? Yeah, I just I just carry a, a saddle and a you know, rope and a snaffle bit and a pair of leggings. Huh. How do you how do you go about transporting that on the plane? Like, do you have some sort of like luggage you use, like yeah. some sort of bag you use for that? Uh, first time we came. Uh, my wife and daughter came with me, and, and Tiffany found some uh, 
bags on the internet like you'd uh, zip up a bale of hay in to carry with you. Oh, yep. Saddle fits in that pretty good, so you get it, put it in there and uh, check it on the airplane. Okay. Good deal. Did you, um, did you like pad it or anything? No. Or do anything no, like we just, that? just wrapped that deal around it, and I took some rope and tied it up pretty snug. And mm -hmm. so it, it works all right. Cool. Yeah. Other than, other than I, um, they charge you extra because it's overweight. <laughs> well, if you're going out there for three weeks, it's probably worth bringing a saddle. So that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so you being, uh, you know, I, I think Ben and I kind of know your um, story a little bit um, just because you're. I say this with the utmost respect, but kind of one of the more old hats in the in the cl clinic deal. Like Buster McCleary is a, I think it'd be fair to say people know that name. Um, but could you kind of, in your own words, um, you know how how did you get from A to B, never being more than two hundred miles from home to hanging out in Hawaii, having to wear ball caps? <laughs> well, I, I I grew up at four sixties. Uh, my daddy was wagon boss when I was born there, and, and then uh, little, when I was about five, they promoted him to foreman at the Triangle Ranch. It's, it's all owned by the same people, and it's right there close to the 60s, so uh, I made a lot of horse tracks in that part of the country, and just our cowboy around worked on uh, most of the area ranches there, and then uh, I guess it was in 85, uh, the Sixes hired Ray Hunt to come help us start a bunch of coats and I was pretty skeptical to start with uh, but Ray showed up and by noon that first day I, I didn't know what that fellow had with a horse but I wanted some of it but he he could literally get horses to do things I didn't even know they could do and without much fuss so uh, it I by that time I was I don't know 28 nine years old I'd been further horseback than most people rode an automobile, but I, it turns out I didn't know a lot about how a horse operates, and why he does what he does, and the way he thinks. So that was one big thing that Ray helped me to see was, you know, how the seeing things from the horse's perspective, and uh, not just you know getting to do something through force, fear, and intimidation. Uh, so I'm, I'm still studying on that part of it. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's actually quite a, in my opinion, quite a testament to your character that you were that age and had that level of experience, and you were able to kind of recognize what Ray had going on, you know. Yeah, um, I, I always kept one because I love to be a horseback, and there's nothing I'd rather do even today than work cattle horseback. So when I saw what a difference uh, getting along with a horse a little better made in the job I was able to do and, the, and made the work that much more enjoyable. I was, I was all about it. I, uh, I didn't, I, I, for all those years, had never given the horse enough credit. And, uh, you know, I, I had a reputation for riding pretty good kind of horses at that time. But uh, after Ray came along, they, they, were, they were way better. Well, as you being a clinician, you probably know, like, being able to admit that, that someone has something that you don't have and being able to say, hey, I, I need to take the time to learn this. That's, that's the first step. And in some st stages, that's the hardest step for people. Right? Well, it is, especially for a man, uh, especially for a cowboy. Uh, we tend to be a little bit set in our ways. Uh, and I had to I had to give it quite a little thought because no one else in that part of the country was was kind of taken to it like I did, and so I thought, well, am I doing this just to be different, or is there is there a, a benefit to it? And I decided for myself anyway. Until you admit to yourself that the way you've been doing things could be improved upon, not necessarily that you was doing it all wrong, but. You can you can improve on it. Uh, it's pretty hard to get much better. 
I, I, since I, since then, I've gone saying it, it doesn't take a lot of effort to be mediocre. Yeah, that's very true. Hmm. So, uh, I, uh, I worked around, I was, I was running ranch up in the Panhandle of Texas and, uh, the owners separated, split up. So I kind of run out of a job all of a sudden and we moved, moved back down between Gessner and Benjamin and, uh, rented a little old place. And I was just going to day work and ride some horses until I could find another good job. And so first one person and another got to asking for a little help with a horse and then, uh, Two or three of those big ranches asked me to come and help your crew start the coats. So word got out that I was helping people with the horses, and I just there have found another job. And it wasn't what I set out to do. I didn't, I didn't want to do clinics. I wanted to punch cows. Uh, so it's a pretty good little story. I, I was at the Pitchfork Ranch and had helped them for about a week, start a bunch of coats, and we got through on a Friday. And uh, Bob Morehouse was manager there then and he told me so well he said you better hang around we're gonna pull the wagon out Monday and go to Brandon and I, I wanted to be there some kind of bad but I was supposed to be in Madison Wisconsin the next week so middle of next week I'm driving up through the cornfields in Iowa and I'm feeling pretty sorry for myself I thought like, you know my daddy never missed the spring works in the state of Texas ever both of my granddads were cowboys. At least one of my great granddads went up the trail with cattle herds. And here I am headed to Wisconsin to talk to a bunch of people that ain't never going to turn a cow. <laughs> so, but then it, it kind of <laughs> dawned on me, you know, it's, it's like the, the Lord said, well, horses helped my family make a living for well over a hundred years. And now I have the opportunity to give something back to the horse. So that, that kind of changed everything. Good and I, I owe them a bunch just for me, though, because I guarantee you I have done some stuff to them now. <laughs> so, yeah. so let me ask you this, Buster, and you kind of alluded to it. Um, you know, adopting kind of those philosophies and that style of horsemanship in a part of the world where it wasn't super prevalent did it i mean it sounds like it obviously worked out for you in the end but initially um did it kind of alienate you at all among your peers yeah a little bit you know nobody said anything out loud but uh when i went doing some things different from what everybody else was or, uh, I, I know they, I know they talked about it when I wasn't around. Nobody ever said anything to me, and you know nobody was so ugly or anything. There, them guys are still all good friends of mine. I, I see quite a few of them, you know, for regular. Uh, but I, I, I love quotes, you know, from different people that have kind of figured things out. And I, I read one one time and said, uh, if if they're talking behind your back, that means you're ahead of them. <laughs> there's a little something to that yeah 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 fair enough that's the truth hey, Buster I kind of have a half question half observation like you said you know you got to helping people and it just turned into a business and that's something we talk about quite a bit on here and today for like a young guy who's getting handy at this, like moving into doing clinics and helping people is something you almost have to do some advertising. Like you have to, you have to find a little bit of a following. And it sounds like when you started out, that must've been cool because there was a great need for help with horses. And this was a kind of a new approach in the country and probably even in parts of the world at the time. So if you were getting something done with a horse, people noticed it. A lot quicker and would ask for help and today it's not like there's a ton of good hands but there's a lot of information and a lot of people doing this kind of thing and so if you're going to get into the clinic business you have to make a you know a considerable effort and put yourself out there and kind of say i'm going to do clinics and 
I, I guess if there was someone wanting to do that, would you have any good advice for somebody um, starting out what they would, what they ought to think of or kind of self-evaluate before they started doing some clinics? Um, because there isn't as much of a need as much of it is, well, there is a need, but, you know, you still have to kind of put yourself out there and make it more of a decision than it just kind of happens to you. I don't think, at least from what I can tell, it doesn't seem like it just happens to people as much anymore. And, um, you know, you got to make a choice that you're going to start teaching. Right. And, you know, you, you know probably better than I do that, that there's a clinician behind every cedar tree nowadays. And uh, uh, when we I came out here last fall, and me and another boy, and, and stayed about, oh, two or three weeks. And we stayed in a little old bunkhouse right here close to the breaking bins. And we didn't have any TV, but got internet service here. And my, my daughters had bought me a, a one of these little laptop computers for Christmas. I've probably turned it on three or four times since I had it. Anyway, I pulled it up and I, I went to uh, looking for coke starting videos. You know, my daddy always told me, said, son, you watch everybody, you, you can learn what not to do, what's same what to do. So I watched a bunch of different coke starting videos and I've watched a few here this time and I, I just I watch them until I can't stand it anymore and I go click next and I just there's they, like you said there's a lot of information out there and there's a little of it is good uh, there, there's some good clinicians in the country I mean really good ones I, I can name you four or five of them out of the 9,000 that's out there. But the main deal I see with people doing clinics nowadays is they have about zero experience. You know, they went to a clinic and they learned something and they rode a few horses, so now they're a clinician, which is all right. This this is America. You start your own business. If you're good at what you do or have a good product, it'll probably work. But there's quite a little competition out there. And, uh, you know, Ray Hunt used to ask people, say, you know what it takes to be a horse trainer? And they said, no. And he said, all it takes is enough guts to hang your sign out there on the road or, or a horse trainer. And here comes the victim. So I've added to that. I say, you, I ask people, I tell people that story. And I ask them, I say, you know what it takes to be a clinician? They said, no. I said, even less. It's a big hat in the Facebook page. Now you're a clinician. <laughs> that's pretty good but but I see uh, and, and most of the horses they're fooling with you know in general most horses nowadays they're, they're raised in the barn in the backyard and they've been around people you know their whole life so there's not that many touchy horses out there that's you know really afraid of people and, and haven't just you know had very little if any experience around people and so my deal is if you're going to do clinics You'd better be able to help whatever kind of horse they bring to you. You might not be able to help the person at all, but you'd better be able to help that horse because he knows the difference. And uh, if you're not doing it for you and the horse, it ain't going to work. Oh, you'll get some things done, but you'll never get the very best part of the horse because he knows. He knows exactly. Uh, Ray used to say, you worked one of them things five minutes, he knows you ten to one you know him. And I found that to be true. So you will start in on one of them things. He knows whether you know. He also knows if you don't know. And he will respond accordingly. Yeah, you may get a little kick out of this. Um, so I, I ride with Buck Branham as much as I can. He's been... The, the guy that I saw and got into this style of horsemanship. And like most young men that are impressionable, <laughs> early on, you know, first clinic I went to, I said, man, I want to be like Buck. And I wanted to be a horseman, but I just wanted to be like him. And part of being like him was being a clinician. You know, I just thought that was a just a career choice you could pick for yourself and go do it. So I was working for a guest ranch in Colorado. Really nice folks. And, uh, 
they kind of gave me the opportunity to work for them and then ride some horses and just explore and go to clinics and learn what I could. And it was like a good, good place for me to be. And so I talked to the owners and I said, Hey, you know, I think I could do some of these horse lessons and we could get some people together. And in my mind, I was thinking I was just going to do what Buck did. Just start doing clinics. I, I was the dumbest guy you've ever met, I guess, because like I was going to do it on Friday and this lady called me on Wednesday or it might've been Thursday morning. And she was going on and on about counter cannering and how she needed help with it. And I think I did a lot of mmm and aha uh-huh and stuff like that. And then when I got off the phone, I went on Google and looked up what counter cantering was. Counter cantering is easy. I I, well, but I, that's what, what an idiot I was, right? Yeah. That's what an idiot I was is that <laughs> this person was going to come to a lesson because I thought I, I was going to embark on becoming a clinician. And I didn't even really know what the term counter canter meant. So I went in the little office there and I talked to the lady that ran the place. And I said, Hey, uh, how many more of those were we going to do? And she's like, well, we're going to do this weekend. And you know, that weekend I said, yeah, let's, uh, let's cancel all that. I, I don't think I'm going to do this. <laughs> and, uh, and, <laughs> and then, you know, from there on, I started getting better help and, and things started turning around. And I think about that a lot. Cause I, I don't mean ill will on anybody like the guys you're talking about, the clinicians that are pretty, you know, pretty, uh, there's lots of them, but, I, cause I did that. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> that was the, the dumbest part of my horse career so far, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it, I didn't, it seemed like a rational plan in the beginning sure. until I realized that I was an empty vessel. In fact, I don't even know if I was a vessel. Well, uh, to the counter counter, there ain't nothing to it. You just lope around in the wrong lead. Yeah. That's always there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, and that, yeah, that was just a kid that had been getting on horses and riding really fast. And then I saw a buck and thought, well, I'll just slow it down and, and wear cool clothing and do it like that. That's, that's about as much as I knew at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I think one, one thing that probably helped me is that I did have a, a world of experience. I, I could ride anything. i I'd been horseback my whole life and, and uh, you know, working on them ranches, they they give you a mount of horses, and, and you were expected to ride whatever they let out to you, and, and make a hand on it. So there's no excuses about well, this and buck to that is hard to saddle, or this and kick you, or whatever. You just you had to figure out how to go and make a hand on whatever kind of horse it was. And in fact, when I was I was little, I was about twelve years old. We was there to you up, you down ranch, and, and me and my daddy was trying to put bunch of old trotty cows to a gate and a pretty thick brush around there. They just want to run off and we were trying to keep them held up, get them to see the gate. Finally, one old cow just bellied down, run down the fence, run past me, you know, I, I messed it on the fence. In a little bit, we got the rest of them put through the gate and Daddy said, why don't you let that cow get down the fence there? Now, you know, I mumbled something like, excuse me, I couldn't get my horse up there or whatever, but it's his fault. And he, he told me, he said, son, he said, if you're going to punch cows for a living, you're going to have to ride a lot of different kind of horses. They're not all going to be good, and they're not all going to be gentle. But you're going to have to learn to ride them and get along with them and hold up your share, share of cattle. No excuses. So that's kind of the mentality I grew up with. And I, you know, I saw lots of horse battles just because we was, you know, forcing them to do things. But I, I know what a horse can do to you. And most people don't have a clue how much the horse fills in for them and, and lets them get by with things that should have gotten killed. And that's where I see a lot of these young guys, clinicians, you know, working with a colt, and they have no no clue what that colt could do to them. And they don't see that he's he's telling them, you know, this ain't working, it ain't working. But the horse, he kind of fills in for the most part and gets it done anyway. It, it never ceases to amaze me how much the horse can get done with very little help from the human. But the, the thing about the horse is he really wants to get along. Uh, you know, most of them. He really, he doesn't, the horse doesn't like trouble. That's a, that's a human thing. Some humans just seem to like trouble. 
with a horse, if he can find any way to avoid trouble, he will. And there's another thing that I believe is there's, uh, there's something that God put in the horse where he really wants to please the human. But he said, how? How am I going to get this done and not get in trouble, not get hurt? And once he figures that out, he said, oh, yeah, that's all there is to it. Let's do it. You know? and then you get him working at something else. He's afraid. First thing you know, you, you prove to him he's not going to get hurt. He's like, well, that's all there is to it. I can do that too. So pretty soon, if you build that confidence, he believes he could do anything you ask him to do. And I think that's what Tom Lawrence was talking about when he said he should feel like you could ride him up a telephone pole or down a badger hole, but you'd never ask him to because he couldn't. But he'd feel like he could. That, that's a pretty that's a pretty great feeling with Austin. If you ask him to, he said, let's go, I'll help you. Yeah, that's a good aspiration. And, and there's no Buster. there's no forcing that on there. There's no way to make that happen. Yeah. That's another big thing I learned from Ray, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard Buck say it, is all we're trying to do is operate the life in his body down through his legs to his feet, through his mind. Now, I'll admit, after I, I first met Ray, I, I was maybe a few years before I heard those last three words, or before they meant anything much. But we're not trying to get the horse to do something. We're trying to get him to think about doing it. See? Because if he thinks about doing it, he knows how to arrange his feet and balance to get a job done, whatever it might be. Speed up, slow down, turn around, go around a barrel, over a jump, turn a cow. He knows how to do all that. But if we get him to think about doing it, then he's a, a willing partner. And your partner, he'll try to help you do anything you want to do. Your, your buddy might not. Or if a guy's afraid of you, he wouldn't do any more than he had to. But that's what I, I told my my daughter had been showing some rain cows and, and getting along pretty good. And she had a little mare. Oh, this mare was touchy. Oh, like she was four or five years old before she ever got very gentle. And I'm not exaggerating. So, of course, she, you know, she loved that mare. And, and I, I won't say she babied her around, but there were times I said, you, you can call on that mare a little more. She, she's capable of a little more than that. And I, I told her one time, I said, your, your partner, he'll help you do a job. What are you going to do? If he's Because when partners, uh, it's like if you and I went in business together, you'd do everything you could think of to make our business a success, and I'd do everything I could think of to make our business a success. And that's what a partner is. Now, your buddy, you say, well, let's go this, do this, and he might say, well, let's drink one more beer and think about it. Yeah, is that a, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> is that all rain coming down in the background there? Yeah, yeah, it's raining that straight now. Are those birds too? You can hear twittering a little bit, or is that something else? Yeah, it's some wild chickens out here. Oh, the island's covered in wild chickens. It's a nice <laughs> backdrop to your speech. I guess uh, good sound effect. Uh, well, we don't charge extra for that. No, I just throw that in there. You know, if I was in West Texas, the wind and dirt would be blowing. <laughs> yeah, we sure appreciate that. <laughs> so, Buster, can I tell you um, the first time I ever, like, heard of you or, like, saw your name anywhere? Because to me, it's very comical. Well, I hope it wasn't at the post office. <laughs> <laughs> no sir no sir but um you know like kind of like a lot of guys who um you get really excited like when you first get introduced to this type of horsemanship and and you kind of just like scour the internet right for for everything um but there's the first time i ever saw you was a video and it was talking about I, I guess you'd say like the cowboy culture of West Texas. And you were talking about like tying, tying hard and fast versus dallying. Right. And, and, and several other, uh, I guess you'd say kind of, kind of different, some varying dogmas between maybe 
maybe a more horsemanship type approach and and a more classical cow puncher type deal if that's a okay if that if that's a diplomatic way to say it um <laughs> but i i just remember because like I, I like obviously in retrospect now i like see all that stuff but uh there's a lot of things you say and do you know what video i'm talking about i do it's, it's waddy mitchell and i talking about different yeah. uh, north and south i was trying to educate him he's hard hitting her. yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, go. Can you can you set the scene and, and and talk about that that video? I haven't seen it in a couple of years now, but I have that. Anytime someone says Buster McCleary, I um, I I can't remember exactly what you say. You talk about dallying, and you're like the people who dally have like commitment issues yeah. or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was uh, these people were doing the, some kind of documentary. I never have seen the video, but I remember them being there, uh, filming it. And Waddy Mitchell and I are, are good friends. And of course, we see things a little different. And so I was, I was talking about, or we were talking about dallying versus tying on. And I'd, I'd tied on all my life. Everybody in our part of the country ties on. And so I always tease Waddy and Buck and Joe and Brian and them guys, Martin. I said, yeah, you, you dally guys. Y'all you ain't committed to nothing, you know. If everything's not just straight, when everything comes tight, if it doesn't look like it's going to work out just right, y'all just turn your little rope loose. And I said, well, I said, tie that thing on there. I said, y'all don't have any good stories to tell. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, you, when, you, when you tie it on there, you're committed. And, and I've, got, I've got some good stories to tell. <laughs> Yeah, that's the yeah. the only part of the video I really remember is when you said that at the end. You said, "Yeah, you ought to try it sometime." You have a lot of stories if you live through it. <laughs> yeah, if you live through it, it's some good stories. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. Well, you're here with us, so we're all ears. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, yeah well, give us a, a tying on story. Well, long one or short one. <laughs> hey, man, we got all day. Uh, when I was at I was at the sixties, uh, uh, I grew up with some boys named Slover. There was three brothers, Don and Jim, Bruce, and I worked with them quite a bit. Anyway, uh, Jim and I had to be working there at the same time, and uh, this was I call it the pre Ray Hunt days. So the horses could have been a little iffy at times. Anyway, I had a a really good sorrel horse. Uh, as long as he kept that rope up off the ground, it didn't touch him on the leg because he would have a come apart if it even touched him down there. It would stake him when he was wrong and he stayed tangled up and stake rope all down. So he was deathly afraid of the rope. But there's no telling how many thousand cattle I roped down. He was a good roping horse. Just had to be careful. Well, Jimmy had a half brother to him that was a little bit the same way. So we went down and we was going to ship some old Brangus bulls, old shipper bulls. And we had them a little trap down there called Mitchell Trap. And, uh, a guy named Bill Hempel was wagon boss there at the time. So he told us the evening before, he said, you boys ride your bull roping horses in the morning. He said, all them bulls going on the truck. But that, that old pasture was just rough and brushy. And the old bulls, you know, they'd try to get away. So, so we get right up to the pens and there's a, it's kind of kind of a funny corner in this pasture and you turn south toward the pins and then there was a wing that stuck out there to help pin cattle there. So just as we get the bulls going in the pen, one old bull looks up and sees where he's at and what's going on and he wasn't close to me but he blowed snot and knocked the horse nearly out from under somebody and took off running and him held hard to catch him. But I, I already had my rope down for some reason or another and so I, I cut out on this bull, and he's running right straight at the end of that wing, that little short fence sticking out there. And just as he got there, I throwed at him, and and he ducked around the end of that wing, just ducked out from under my loop. So I could hear somebody coming behind me, so I just I just run straight and jerk my rope out of the way, and, and then turn back toward the bull. Well, it was Jimmy Slover, and he runs out there just a little ways and, and catches this bull, uh, pretty deep, kind of back about where the collar works. And this bull probably weighed, you know, 1,800, 2,000 pounds. And as soon as he got him caught, this little horse went to slow him down. 
And Jimmy just spurred him to go on. He kept on, went to holler at me and said, you don't know my story, my saddle's not tight. And I thought, well, then that's hell to nope. They're roping a bull and your saddle's not tight. So the horse is trying to slow down, and the bull, it's slowing the bull down enough. He's just kind of taking long bucking jumps. So it pulled Jimmy's saddle up on this horse's way in front of his withers. Now he's trying to buck, but he can't because this bull's dragging him longer. And this bull bucks around, and he's bucking up towards that corner in the fence there. And Jimmy, he's hollering, rope him, Michael, I rope him. Well, he's not presenting a very good target at the time. But I, I see this bull headed that corner, and I thought, that sucker's going to run through that fence and drag Jimmy that horse. So I was going to throw in there and try to catch a foot or something. But just as the bull got to the fence, he just spun around and faced both of us. So, you know, and Jimmy tied on 30 feet of rope, and his saddle is up in front of that horse's withers, and the horse, he's standing there humped up, and Jimmy's got one foot out of the stirrup, and it's up on the cantle of his saddle. He's wanting to go somewhere, but they're not really anywhere to go. <laughs> he looks over at me, and he said, rope that SOB. Well, when the bull turned around, it pulled Jimmy's rope right up behind his ears, and the, the Honda's on top of his neck, so the rope's coming. I said, you're going to have to scoot up a little bit, put some slack in that rope before I can get a shot at him. So Jimmy, he had sat down and he'd kick old teardrop a little bit and that thing would jump. He'd get back up and see the saddle. <laughs> he did that three or four times and finally got enough slack in there that, that I could throw at this bull. And and this bull happened to be off the Diamond A Ranch out at Roswell, New Mexico. And boy, they must raise them things on prick the fire and gunpowder because them things would get you now. They wouldn't just run up there and blow snot. So... He gets a little slack in that rope, and I throw a big hoolan loop out there, and I hit this bull right on top of the head. And when I did, he just he just slung his head. Well, it slung my rope off his head on the far side and back under his neck and up under my horse and caught my horse by one front foot. So, <laughs> oh, this horse is not good about <laughs> this horse is not good about a rope touching him on the foot. Well, when it did, he just sat back and snorts. And I, I see it pull that front foot right up by his nose, and he struck at it with his other front foot, and that's where I divorced him right there. I mean, I left there now. So I run 30, 40 feet before I ever look back, and my horse is standing there, got his front foot pulled right up under his chin. I'm looking across the seat of my saddle at Jimmy, and he's perched up on top of his saddle like a little bird, and he looks over and he's, damn, my player, you've killed us both. <laughs> <laughs> but it all worked out. It all worked out. <laughs> now, was that in the pre-Ray Hunt days? That was the pre-Ray Hunt days, yeah. Hmm. Uh-huh. Man. So what's the protocol if if you really get stuck? Do you have a knife, or what's your get-loose-quick button? Uh, it depends. <laughs> there's no way, to, no way to plan for a wreck. Now, most of it happens so fast. You know, I see people carry a little knife, you know, stuck in the edge of their pocket. It's got the little clip on it. And I often ask them, what, what's that? Well, I might need to cut myself out of a wreck. I, I've never seen anyone be able to cut themselves out of a wreck. I mean, maybe if it went on long enough and you're by yourself and things got stopped, maybe you could. But it's it's usually someone else that comes to rescue you. Hmm. Well, is there an advantage dallying versus tying off, tying oh, on yeah. hard and fast? Yeah, you. Bet. I mean, I, I, in my opinion, I mean, I don't know everything, but I think dallying would be an advantage. But uh, what, what do you think? Well, it, it depends on where you are. The uh, reason everyone ties on out in our part of the country, it's rough and brushy, and you know, if if you dallied and rim fired a big tree going pretty fast, you probably can't put enough dallies on there to hold it. When things come tight going that fast, them dallies will go zing and they're gone. Uh, and also, if you dally and slow one down, and he's out there on 40 feet of rope or 50, they might be five cedar trees between you and him. And so you never get back up to him. Every time you give him slack, he goes around another tree. And it, so it just doesn't fit that part of the country as far as roping outside. Uh, but yes, dallying has a lot of advantages. Really good on a young horse, and and I saw I saw men dally when I was a kid, 
if they got something caught and they got it down, you know, and they'd get up short to hold a big cow or bull down. Now they, but they'd be dallying over top of their horn hog. Probably not the safest thing in the world, but of course can hold a little more on a short rope. And so yeah, there's there's a lot of advantage in, in dallying. It just it, it's where it fits or not. Hmm. It, it's kind of like the difference in split range versus a McCarty. I ride split range because that's what I grew up with. Buck rides McCarty because that's what he grew up with. Well, the reason for split range is, like I say, down in our country, lots of big trees. And if you were going very fast and hung a big tree limb in the that McCarty range, you'd turn the horse over now. It'd be a pretty good wreck. So with split range, you can drop one rein and keep going, pick it up in front of that tree limb and keep going. Where out in the, you know, in the, Northwest, it's all big open country, and I, I worked up at the Spanish ranch in Nevada a little bit, so it wasn't unusual at all to be 20, 30, 40 miles from the wagon every day. So, and there's no fences up there, you know. So, if a guy you get out that far from the wagon, if a horse bucks you off or falls with you, if you've got that get down line tucked in your belt, you might hang on to him and not have to walk back with it. It's a long walk to the wagon up there because there ain't no roads. They're not going to come out there and get you in the pickup. So it, the different equipment fit the country. And, and, and so there was a reason for it at one time. Now it's just mostly a matter of style, whatever the person likes. But all that, all that equipment was developed for a reason. It had a, a purpose at one time. Have you ever seen somebody get a McCarty hung up on something like that going pretty fast? No, I never have. It's just no one in our country riding one. Now, I did have, I made me a pair of hackmore reins one time out of a, a cotton rope, and I untwisted it and then braided it back with it real soft. And I had learned how to tie this fancy knot of some kind. So I tied one in the end of them reins. And of course, I ride the reins crossed over the horse's neck, and I, I was just in a long trot, and one of those reins flipped out to the side and hung in the fork of a tree because it come over my horse's neck. And just going in a trot, it did turn us upside down. Now. So you could imagine if going fast and, and hang a rein there. If nothing else, you know, a snap a bit, it sure tear a horse's mouth up. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. If anybody down there, you know, had a loop on a McCarty, but it sounds like you even had it split, but it was just the rope and that yeah. knot on the end. Just, yeah, just that knot. Yeah. Yeah. When I yeah. got back to the barn, I cut them knots off there and got me some baling wire or something and wrapped it. <laughs> it wasn't a big knot there. Yeah. So, wow. have you? I guess. The next question would be like, have you run into that deal with split reins where you've had to drop a rein and then just keep on going? Oh yeah, lots of times. Yeah, you you know you feel a, a limb hanging, just dragging it out of your hand. You just turn it loose and reach over in front of that limb and get it and keep it going. Gotcha. Interesting. Man, that's a lot of stuff I wouldn't have thought about. And then, you know, in our country, things happen usually quite a bit faster than out in the open. You know, when, if you, you know, jump something you need to catch, it's it's got to happen right now. But you, you can't run one of them things half a mile down through the brush and expect to get him. Occasionally you can stay up that long, but usually the further you go, the more advantage the cow has of getting away just because of the brush in the rough country. They, they can go places you can't go horseback. And they know where those places are. <laughs> so, so what do you do, though? Because when, you, when you're tied hard and you've roped something, you've got, what, about 30, 35 feet from you to the animal? Yeah, about 30 feet. Maybe a little less because you've got a loop around that animal's neck. So most guys carry about a 30-foot rope. Uh Sometimes thirty. If you're, if you're, maybe going to catch some wild cattle, a thirty-five foot rope might be a little advantage there. Uh, but for the most part, they're thirty-foot rope. So you're, 
you're pretty close to one, and it's we're talking about roping that bull while ago. It's amazing how fast a big herd bull can move. I mean, they they can come up thirty feet of rope in about three jumps. So, how would a guy go about um, if you had to rope it on your own and then lay it down on your own and doctor it, tie it hard? Well, it, it again depends on where you are. Uh, if you if you've got a little open there, and again, depending on what you've got roped, uh, a bull or a, you know a big cow would be a hell of a jerk if you just laid a trip on him. And I, I've done it, but uh, you better be a horseback when you do. So if you get one stopped and facing you, and a lot of times they'll be on the fight. So if one runs at you, you leave that slack laying on the ground until he crosses over it with his front feet and pick it up. And and it, it turns them over that way. And uh, a lot of times when you do that, uh, like for a horn cow, if you turn one over like that, you know, his head sticks in the ground, so you, you might have a horn hung in the dirt there. And if your horse will keep that rope tight, uh, that'll hold him down long enough you can get to him and, and get him tied. I, I prefer not to rope a bull by myself. It, it just... It's a dangerous, the roping bull is a dangerous deal if there's four or five of you there. But if you're by yourself, there's certainly some things you can go wrong in a hurry. But, you know, if it's necessary, I've done it. But it, it's not something I look forward to. Makes sense. And I had a guy ask me here a while back, me and my, well, that's what I was telling you about Jimmy Slover. We were, we was day working at this place, and we said something about roping a bull on a three year old bronc. And, this young guy was there and said, oh, you guys tell pretty wild stories about what y'all used to do when you, you know, and I said, no, I've, I've, I've caught a Brangus bull on a three-year-old horse. And in fact, I have a picture of it. In fact, it's that horse I was telling you about that was a little pretty iffy about a rope. He was just a three-year-old and we was putting a bunch of bulls through a gate and this one run off and he run out by me. So I run out there and caught him. Now, I didn't jerk him over backwards when I caught him. And I didn't lead him a mile and a half back to the gate, but I did get him stopped, and I held him until another guy got there on the old horse, and I gave him the rope. And if somebody healed him or got a rope on hind leg, and I gave that other guy my rope. But I, I did catch him on the three-year-old ground. Now, he drug us a little ways down through the cedars before I got him stopped, but he didn't get away. <laughs> Sounds like that. That horse has seen some stuff, Buster. That, that horse has seen some stuff, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> at, at that time, I wasn't. At that time, I wasn't afraid to push on them bridle reins and expose one. Going fast didn't bother me at all. Yeah, again, I, I like how you preempted that with the pre-buck. I mean, the pre uh, pre Ray Hunt days. Yeah, pre Ray Hunt days. That kind of covers a multitude of sins, huh? It does that. It's like a life before that's, salvation. That's where that's where most of them stories come from. <laughs> yeah. Man. So, so could you tell us a little bit about um about one of those deals would look like when like when Ray would come to start a bunch of colts? Like, I, I'd be really curious to hear about the logistics of that because. You know, people say, like, they, they say that, like, oh, you know, Ray Hunt or whoever, like, Buster's coming to help us start all these Colts, right? And then they talk about the numbers, and then it's like, okay, um, well, how does, you know, I assume you probably have some folks helping you, and, like, you, you got to kind of be wise with your time to get that many horses worked in a day. You know right. what I mean? And so um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear about, you know, what you're doing in Hawaii. But it's, um, like when Ray would come on those ranches when you first saw him, what would that look like? When you guys got up in the morning, like how how would a normal day go for getting those uh, horses going? The, the first few times he came, uh, he, he would saddle all them horses himself the first day. And we start like the Sixes had four on four different ranches. So, you know, they'd bring guys from all four ranches. We'd start 
20, 25 head of colts at a time. And we, and these colts had been, I won't say halter rope, but they'd had a halter on and we'd wooled them around little, you know, their big wiener colts. Uh, looking back, mostly we just terrorized them. But anyway, they, they had had a little human contact. So we'd run one in the bronc pen and Ray would rope him horseback and he'd, Wool him around there, and he kept talking about getting one ready to saddle. We didn't have a clue what he's talking about. But anyway, he'd work him horseback a little, and then he'd get off and just take the cords of his rope and sack him out with cords of that rope. And when he thought he had him ready, he said, Archie, bring a saddle. So you take your saddle in there and set it down. And uh, it amazed me. He, he'd lead that horse up that saddle and just pitch the cords of his rope out there and saddle that thing. And most of them never moved. I couldn't believe it. You could saddle a two-year-old bronc and not tie a foot up or hobble him or both or snug him to a post or another horse. Or, gee, it was, I couldn't believe it. So he would saddle all oh, 20 or 25, whatever it was. And then, you know, he'd turn them loose and he'd move them around out there and, and we'd get them back in and catch them and, and uh, well, just kind of get them ready to get on. We didn't, didn't usually ride them the first day. He'd have us, we got them all caught, which might take a while. He'd have us lead them out and unsaddle them and saddle them back up ourselves. And that was the first day. So next morning, we were supposed to saddle them all ourselves and turn them loose in a big pen. And he'd get there and move them around the horseback. And then we'd pin them in that bronc pen and catch them. I mean, put them in the, in the bronc pen. And Ray would just ride in there and he'd rope one with his light rope and snub him up our close, hold him, you get on him. And... He'd say, he'd pull that rope off and said, just ride him around, pet him a little bit, just ride him like his grandma's horse. His old grandma wasn't a bronc rider. And he'd go through the whole deal. I mean, see, he'd fool around and rope 20 head of horses in that 60 foot pen, and that could get a little exciting. But anyway, he'd get all of us mounted, and he'd get his flag, and he'd drive us around this way, and you know, he'd tell us, liven your legs up, and we'll go. And then sit quiet and we'll let them stop and then he'd go the other way. So he'd do that. I don't know, he did it, I don't remember, three or four times each direction, two or three times. And that, that bronc pin there was made out of metal and had a sliding latch on the gate going out in this big horse lot. So he told everybody, he said, just sit real quiet, let them find a place to stop. Well, you know, some of them was pretty bothered, so it might, might take five minutes for all of them to get completely stopped. And he said, when they stop, just reach up and rub on them. So we're sitting there rubbing on these coats and everything gets stopped. And, and you hear that gate light go, cha-ching. Everybody looks around. He grins real big. He said, you guys are cowboys. You like to ride horses? Let's go for a ride. And he just turned us out. <laughs> I thought we was all going to die. But <laughs> we got out in that big crowd. He moved us around out there a little bit. Pinned us back in the round pen. He had everybody put a halter on the fence. Before we, before we got started. So he'd go and he'd gather up three or four halters. He'd ride by and hand you one. He'd say, here, get him ready and put it on him. And we're still sitting on him. And, you know, guy sitting there holding that halter like, how in the hell you do this? Like, act like you didn't even know which end to go on. Finally, somebody got brave enough to ask him, go, Ray, how, how would you put one on like sitting up here? He said, think. <laughs> so we finally all got the halter on him. And then, uh, you know, we you know, where you could bend them a little, move your hindquarters. He'd turn us around with the flag. And the next day, we'd put a snaffle bit on them and ride them a little. And about the third day, we'd, we'd go outside and we'd go somewhere. And and didn't have much trouble. I just, I couldn't believe it. Just didn't have much trouble. You hear stories from people that were around back then that went to Ray Hunt cult startings. Most of them aren't too handy that tell these stories, but they say they they got bucked off or someone they knew almost died and got bucked off. But do you think that had those people that almost got killed or bucked off listened to Ray more carefully and just trusted him, you think they would have been all right and that was more on them? Yeah, I'd say a bunch of them was. I, I went to – I didn't get to be around Ray very much, but I, I would go to a clinic – you know, if he was in our part of the country and I could get loose, I'd maybe just go visit for a day and watch. But I saw people do things 
that he was sitting there telling them, you know, don't do that. But I don't know, they didn't hear him or they didn't understand. Uh, I don't know, but a lot of it was, they caused it themselves. Either, either yeah. intentionally or not. Uh, I, I went to one up in Colorado Springs one time and, and there was a lady had a big old two-year-old coat, big tall thing. And, and he was pretty gentle to me, he was. Anyway, she gets on him and Ray's driving around. He, we kept telling people, I'll reach up and rub him, move around, you know, but she's kind of scared. And so she just kind of hid behind the saddle horn and when they'd stop, she didn't put much effort into bending him. And uh, so in a little bit, the colt kind of got scared and she jerked on that lead rope and he bucked her off. It didn't take much, but anyway, jumped out from under. And so she believes she's hurt and she can't ride anymore. So they, there's another boy there, he said, well, he, he would try him. And it kind of scared the colt. So Ray told him when he got on, I said, now just, just get on him and pet him and leave him alone, leave his head alone. Let him relax. So we moved around there a little bit. And then the coat kind of got scared and grabbed his tail. And the kid jerked on that lead rope and he bucked him off. And they said, well, that's probably enough. Let's put him up before we get him in any more trouble. So the next day, there's another boy was going to try him. He did the same darn thing. He just The coat got a little tight and the boy got a little tight. He bucked him off, knocked her out of him. So that evening, and I, I'm just there watching. You know, nobody knew who I was. So I just started watching. So I hear some people talking that that night there was a guy coming from Kansas or somewhere. He was sure enough a bronc rider, and he was going to ride that sort of coke the next day. Uh, well, this might be pretty good. The guy knows what he's doing. So. But he gets on him. He wasn't on that thing three minutes, and he bucked him off right over his head. And it, it made this kid mad because he knew everybody was talking about him being a bronc rider. So he gets back on him and he didn't last any time. That horse bucked him off that time. I mean, knocked the air out of him. It, he didn't want any more. So, after lunch, Ray said, uh, why don't you ride that soft colt in the morning? I said, yeah, after he bucked three people off five times, you want me to ride him? Oh, hell, he said, he'll be all right. Just ride him around. So, so I rode him the next day. And it just, he left him alone. He wasn't nothing to him. And they were all ready to go outside, so they went outside and he left me and he brought me a snap a bit over there. He said, bend him around that little bit and come on down to the big round pen when you're ready. So in a little bit, I rode him down there and I said, well, it, wasn't, it wasn't that much to him other than the people riding him. Um, I won't say they weren't trying to get along, but they kind of didn't know how. They were, they were more worried about protecting themselves than helping the horse. Way it looked. So I, I see some of that going on. Mm -hmm. I, I always tell people if, if you think about helping your horse, he'll take care of you. But if you're just worried about you, he knows it and he'll do what he thinks he has to do to protect himself, whatever that might be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's tough because for a lot of people, it's like a leap of faith, right? To to stay relaxed when things start going to hell in the handbasket. Oh man, that, that that's the answer, but it's not necessarily intuitive, especially if you haven't lived on your whole life on the back of a horse, you know. Well, see, that was part of the reason I was skeptical about Ray, because you know how ignorant he is. All I, all I knew about Ray was he went around these towns and did clinics, whatever that was, and. And they rode them colts the first time with nothing on their head. That's what I'd heard about. So I think, well, if he goes to these towns, if the horse is raised in the barn in the backyard, they general anyway, he might get along with them. But that riding them with nothing on their head, I knew that was bull because they'd been telling me all my life, son, if you're going to live, you better get a hold of that thing. And the way we treated them, you better get a hold of them. So somebody asked me later, I said, what was that like getting on that colt with nothing on his head? I said, I, f I found out what both sides of that side of one felt like at the same time. Well, I had a choke coat on that thing. I, I couldn't believe And I picked a coat just out of honor. I picked a coat that was out of an old triangle mare that never was halter broke. And, boy, she would get you, and her coat was all 
they were all bad news. So I just kind of picked him to prove it wouldn't work on a real ranch horse. That horse never bucked a jump in his life. Yeah. When I left there, he was one of the best horses I ever rode. And after I left, uh, Dr. Blodgett took him down to Maribyrn. He rode him until he retired, I guess. Good little bay horse, called him Jigger. <laughs> Buster, it sounds like <laughs> what, what Ray Hunt was doing was pretty revolutionary to how you grew up. So what compelled you to go ride with Ray the first time you went? Well, they, they brought him out to the 60s. Oh, you didn't really have a choice then? No. No, they, you know, they said, this guy's coming to help you start these colts. Do whatever he says. <laughs> Do you know how he got linked up with the Sixes? Well, there was a guy had come through that country the year before that knew Ray. Or didn't know, he knew of Ray. And he was talking about, you know, how he started colts. And the manager at our time, J.J. Gibson, you know, Sixes put a lot of money in their horse program. And J.J. was for anything he thought would help them horses. But he said, we're going to give this a shot. And at that time, uh, Jimmy Slover and I were kind of in charge of the romp band. We'd always had a little crew by. At that time, we started all the coats for, the, for all the cowboys. So he said, we're going to try this new way and see what happens. When when you were told about that initially, did you feel like you were almost being challenged a little bit? Because, I mean, the, the way you say that, it's almost like Ray's coming in to do your job. Oh, no, I say I was pretty skeptical what he was going to get done. It, it didn't matter to me. We were going to ride him anyway. He was just going to be there a week, and you know, we was going to ride him anyway. So, so uh, I didn't figure we was going to lose anything. Didn't know how much we was going to gain, but. Didn't matter what he did, we was going to go and ride him anyway. So how long did it take you to be a believer? Was it like by the end of the first day? Uh, Before lunch, the first day. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, I I didn't know what he had with the horse, but I wanted some of it because that that guy was getting things done. See, the first thing when he rode in the round pen that morning, he was riding one of the few older horses that I ever saw Ray ride. It was an old brown horse. He called him T.C., he was, I don't know, seven, eight years old, and he was a good one. So, Ray, he told us, he said, I like to get my horses where I can bend their neck. And he'd pick them rein up, you know, and he couldn't even get the slack out of the rein. His horse bend both ways. And he said, well, he said, you might think he's limber necked, but he's like, move the other end too. He just set his leg against him and move your hindquarters right and left. He said, well, you might say he's limber ass too, but said he knows the difference between that and this. And he just picked his reins up and looked over his shoulder and messed through that thing, turned around six, seven times as fast as one could turn around. And that kind of got everybody's attention. When he stopped, he said, he'll do it the other way too. And he turned that thing around the other way. So he had everyone's attention. They, everybody knew he could get something done with a horse. And then and then to watch him saddle all them colts himself. And like I say, just with the rope around his neck, he just pitch him cold down and saddle him, and most of them never untracked. Hmm. That's awesome. The, the first first coat they run into him was, a, uh, like I say, I was kind of charged with wrong pin, so the day he showed up, J.J. told me, said, if you stay here this evening, meet that guy and show him where to put his horses back there and get them fed, whatever he needs you to take care of him. I said, all right. So uh, we went and pinned these broncs, and like I say, 20, 25 of them in a big corral. Herd. So we get raised horses put away. And I told him, I said, I, I got all these colts pinned up here if you'd like to look at them. Yeah, he said, I always heard these four, six horses. He said, let's, let's go look at them. So he walks down through there, and, and there's a, a bunch of, you know, really, really nice horses. But two days before that, there was a, an old roan horse that showed up there. I don't know where he came from, but it looked like he wore about a number two shoe and his mane and tail was dragging the ground. He was plenty snorty, stud. And, it, you know, he showed up back there to, by the bronc pen. I asked JJ, what's that name? And he mumbled some answer about, well, you know, little foundation blood back in the mares or something. And I, I thought, Lord, that doesn't look like something I'd want to breed a mare to. Wasn't none of my business. 
Well, they brought that horse in there just to test the race, you know. So that's the first one they run in the rump pen after I showed him all them nice colts. But he never said a word. He just reached and caught that thing behind foot. And, well, he looked like he was going to turn around and bend down there for a while, but it wasn't long. He gets off his horse and ties off and saddles that thing. And all the time he had the hind leg caught, he kept rubbing him down the hind leg with his flag and doing quite a bit there. And so when he got him saddled, he takes the rope loose from his horse and he steps in behind that stud stand there. And he picks his foot up with that rope two or three times and just reached down, takes the rope off that horse's hind foot. And he stepped away from him. He just kind of kicked a little dirt under him. Holy cow, that thing chinned the moon now. He was bucking and bawling around there. And that, there's a catwalk around that round pen. And J.J. happened to be standing right above where Ray turned that horse loose. And Ray just looked up and said, now, you might think I've never seen a horse like that before, but I have. Hmm. So there was no doubt right there that guy could get things done. Yeah. Yeah, we've heard, um, you know, kind of in a similar vein, um, as Ben mentioned, the kind of the mentor for us has been Buck Branneman. And he's talked about it happening to Ray and, and happening to him and I'm sure it happens to a lot of folks when they're got a new philosophy um, having to deal like everyone's bringing you like the, the heavyweight to sure. start with right sure. you know because because it'd be awfully convenient if it's like oh well this guy's just a, you know if, if the guy ends up not being the real deal that's way convenient because then you don't have to learn you don't have to change um, you just go back to doing what you're doing Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's, there's always someone out there that's got a horse. They're going to prove to you it won't work on this one. And I've, I've, they've brought me some. Yeah, they, that's, that's what I mentioned a while ago. Men, if you were thinking about doing clinics, if you can't help or handle whatever they bring to you, you don't need to be doing clinics because they're going to bring one somewhere or sometime. Maybe, maybe more than one of them. Yeah. Yeah, they tend, those types of horses tend to, tend to run in packs, it seems like. They're all on the same farm. <laughs> uh, uh, what, well, we're, you know, gleaning some of the West Texas tradition from you. I've got another question. What's the story and tradition behind, I guess it would be the, Maybe the foreman. I'm not exactly sure whose job it is, but the guy who catches the horses for everybody in the morning, and they've got all the horses. They say they got them on the rope, I think, or on the line. And I've seen aerial pictures, or you see it in documentaries or videos, but I've never been around it personally. But it seems like it's the cowpuncher t tradition to catch their horses in the morning by roping them, and they're all looking away on the line. Uh, I've, I've seen that, I've seen pictures of that, uh, maybe more up in the northwest. Uh, was a couple of big outfits way down in far south Texas do that way, but mostly up in our country, uh, whether you're catching horses outside or, or in the trail, they just, they'd be in a bunch. They were, they were bunched up, so uh, when I was young, a lot of times we they just throw them horses up outside and the, the cowboys would like I would pitch my rope to you and you'd pitch your rope to the next guy and he'd pitch it so until we had enough cowboys and rope around this, you know, 100, 150 head horses. And so they were very particular about who they let in there to rope horses. You, you can imagine somebody getting there swinging the rope and, and scare one and get him, run him over the ropes. And so he's learned to run over them ropes. Now you've got trouble can't hold them up. So they were, it was just one or two men, usually the wagon boss and, and maybe the drive leader, the two of the sure enough top hands uh, rode horses for everyone. And of course, those guys, you know, had been there a while and they knew the horses. And uh, so they were they really particular about who rode the horses. And do they pick the horse for you that you're going to ride or do you ask them to pick a certain no, you, one for you? No, you just called out the name of whatever horse you wanted that day. You know, occasionally, this is a good story. 
me and Tony Slover, uh, Wagon was out there at 60 one time, and we just big teenagers, and, and Donnie was trying to ride some saddle broncs. And so uh, Wagon was out southwest to Guthrie out there, and, and uh, the windmiller come by one day, eat with her, eat supper with us. And so Donnie catches a ride back to Guthrie, and Donnie had an old green Plymouth car that the floorboards had rusted out of, and it's kind of had plywood in there for floorboards, which made it easy to clean the beer cans out of it. it just raised plywood up, and beer cans fell out. Anyway, Donnie said, I'm up in the bronc riding in Snyder tomorrow night. He said, come go with me and help me drive back. Well, it's about oh, 100 miles to Snyder. And, of course, we're working seven days a week. And I told Donnie, I said, no, I don't, I don't want to go around and stay out all night. You know, me and him flank caves. And when we got to the pen, we knew what we were going to do. Flank caves. I said, no, I ain't going to stay out. No, he said, said uh, let's go with Mr. Will. I'll ride in the Bronx. So we'll go to that strip and shoot. Get my side and we'll get no green. Come back to the wagon. Well, he knew it was a lie. And I knew it was a lie when we agreed to it. So we got an idea. He rode his Bronx. We went to the strip and shoot and got his saddle and start back across the parking lot towards Old Green and some guys we knew were sitting on the back of the pickup drinking beer and, and Hall Nicks, good fiddle player, was paying at the dance. And uh, so I asked Donnie, he said, how'd the Bronco ride doing? Donnie said, I did this and that. And he said, well, drink one beer and tell us about it. So when we get back to Wagon next morning, they're, they're now to catching horses. And there's a guy named Murray Rogers, Wagon boss. So we just kind of slipped in there like we'd been there the whole time. And I called for some old gentle horse I had, and Donnie called for an old gentle horse I had. And we each had, I had a horse to call Grasshopper. And he had a, anything touched him underneath, and that's the reason he got his name. If a grasshopper flew up underneath him, that circle would jump straight in the air, high as he could jump, and strike with both front feet. And he might buck when he hit the ground, he might not. But you never knew when it was coming, and it would happen all day. And then Donnie had an old Dunn horse to call San Quentin. Because if you could ever get on him, you didn't want to get off. They had, they had a measurable circuit to ride. So we called these two old gentle horses. He catches old grasshopper and leads him out to me and catches San Quentin and leads him out to Donnie. He never said a word. Of course, we knew what to do. We rode them sun looks all morning. Of course, we wasn't in too good shape. We go in and eat dinner. We're catching horses after dinner. We're going to just make a little short drive there in the pasture. Murray catches them things, leads them out there again. He said, I don't believe you boys hurt these horses anymore. morning. Y'all just ride them again this evening. <laughs> <laughs> he he made his point. We we never missed catching horses again. We was there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that I think a lot of people have told themselves that lie. We'll just sit here and have one beer and and, and I'll, yeah. I'll debrief. Now, if I say that, them outfits would they cut you amount of horses, and and as long as you, they was yours. Uh, nobody ride one of your horses, and they would tell you what to do with one. But if you had one, that's pretty tough to get along with. They expected you to ride them, and so that that wagon boss he knew who was riding what. So. If you hadn't ridden this horse in a few days and he figures it was his turn and you needed to ride him, he'd just catch him and lead him out to you. And it was like, you know, if you can't ride him, you can leave, roll your bed and leave, we'll get somebody that can. So occasionally that would happen. Why do you leave one out there and here? Put it on him, let's go. Hmm. Yeah, I imagine that'd be kind of embarrassing to be the guy that says, yeah, no, I'm I'm gonna go pack my things. I don't yeah, want to part of him. That that just it didn't hardly happen. In fact, I don't never remember seeing anybody quit over having to ride one. I know they wanted to probably. I yeah. might have dreaded a couple of them myself. Yeah, but you pretty much give up any chance of being a cowboy if uh, if that's what what caused you to leave an outfit. No, that's true. Along with the horses, you know that word or something like that would get around pretty quick. It'd, it'd be pretty hard to find a job before long. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me ask you this, Buster, because um, these are awesome stories, and I I can listen to them all night, honestly. 
Um, but I am, I'm thinking back to how you said, you know, you were on that trip to Wisconsin, right? And, and going to do, um, you know, going to support your family and get some opportunities uh, through doing clinics. Growing up around the, you know, folks you grew up around, I'd say there was probably a pretty big adjustment having to go and do clinics in different parts of the country where, you know, people don't have that mentality or, or that experience with dealing hor with horses. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it, it's one thing to come and help some cowboys at the sixes start Colts. It's another thing to get the like soccer mom in her forties, get her two year old going with her. Um, that, that just seems like it would be a tough adjustment, but I don't know. I've never done it. So I'd be curious what your thoughts on the whole deal are. Well, it, it was an education for me because, you know, everyone I'd grown up around has been around could ride a horse. And I just, I figured if you had a horse, you could ride him, which didn't turn out to be the case. And, uh, so w w working with the public and, you know, trying to help people not understand how to get along with one it uh, it'll put you to thinking I mean you you gotta you figure out now how can I get how can I get this person to understand and how can I get that person to understand and uh, how many of them ever understand I don't really know you see a few of them uh, that come back that are getting along pretty good but a lot of people uh, they come and hear something and, and maybe see something Maybe you get something working for them that weekend while you're there. But when it runs into a little work and they kind of have to call on themselves, I love to say, I, I just send him to a trainer, or get a different horse, or get a different bridle or something. Uh, they don't, uh, a lot of folks won't give of themselves to really help that horse. And, and I'm, I don't know if you've ever heard Buck say it, Ben, but it, it takes a hell of a lot of work to ride a good horse. Yeah, that's yeah. Absolutely I mean, true. the the people that I know, well, like Buck for sure. You you see them put a lot of time into riding that horse, and then and then a lot of guys, you know. And then if you're not as handy, I guess you got to put more work in. Yeah, exactly. Outwork your incompetence. Well, there's, there's no substitute for experience. And so, you know, I encourage people to ride all the different horses that they can. You know, you can learn something from all of them. Of course, you know, a lot, a lot of folks don't have the opportunity to do that. But, but I do encourage them, if you, you can ride another horse, try a different one. They'll, they'll feel different than the one you've been riding on, guaranteed. But I've, you know, I've rode thousands of them things. And... They're all a little different, and this is starting these colts. They're they all need something a little different. It's, you know, we go. We've had a my wife and I have had kind of a custom colt starting business for the last twenty five years, and so we go around some of these big horse outfits and you know start fifteen, twenty, thirty, sixty head of colts in one place, and uh, so a lot of times if we got a, a new customer, they'd ask a little. Now, what are you going to do with these things? And I said, I don't know. We're going to get them all saddled and ridden. That's the goal. But how we're going to go about it, I don't know. We we let the horse dictate what needs to happen there. And so by having experience with lots of different horses, uh, you have you uh, you can come up with things or you've seen things work that might help this one. And, and I I never know. A person say, well, I'm having trouble with this horse. What I need to do, and I said, well, I can tell you several things you could try. Which one will work, or if any of them work, I don't know. Because with a horse, there's no, uh, you don't just punch a button and twist a dial and things work out. But I think a lot of people, that's what they're looking for. They, they see someone, you know, like Buck or Joe ride a horse, they say, well, I want or Ray, I want my horse to ride just like that one. Well, that's a good goal. But how you get there, there's no, uh, there's no, you do A, B, and C, and you come up with D. You know, Ray used to say that they try to write this stuff in a book. You do this, and you get that. 
But he said, you can bring that book out here and show it to all these different horses, and none of them ever read that book. So the fellow wrote it, he didn't know what the hell he's talking about, or he wouldn't have wrote the book. It just it doesn't work that way. And so some of these clinicians, they got a, a method of this, kind of like a recipe for baking a cake. It might work out all right if you know how to bake anything about baking, but if you don't, it might not help you that much. The, the bad part about those recipes for riding a horse is it, it probably worked real good on a few horses, not quite so well on some others, and not at all on a bunch of them, because they all need something just a little different, just a little different. So if you can't think and adjust and try to figure out what it is that horse needs, uh, it's pretty hard to get along. And if you're stuck in this program or method of doing things, uh, you'll get mediocre results at best. But again, like I say, it's, it's amazing what the horse can come up with in spite of the human. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got a good friend who um, who rode the horse for the public for uh, a while, and and he, the way he put it, at least you know, starting horses and working with horses. He said it's more akin to reading a book than it is to writing a book. And what he meant by that was, I don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, I'm, you know, you're going to make the decisions for, all right, this happened, this cult showing me that they need this. But it's not like, it's not like he's got a program. He's like, I've, I've got this book laid out and I'm just going to write this book using this cult. You can't do that. You have to see what the cult wants you to do and hope it works out. I hope you don't get yourself killed or anything. Well, you hear a lot nowadays about communicating with a horse. That's a pretty common term around the clinic world. Communicate with him. Well, communication is the exchange of ideas and information between two entities. So if you're not listening just as much as you're talking to the horse, uh, it just becomes a lecture. I don't know anybody likes to be lectured. The horse for sure, he don't know what the hell's going on anyway. I think with a horse, especially a young horse, when things are not working out, he's having trouble, if you could ask the horse what was going on, he'd say, well, I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. Besides that, I was afraid. You see, people, humans, have been eating horses a lot longer than we've been riding them. And the horse knows that instinctively. So if we're going to side with the colt, he has no way of knowing that this is not the little ritual we go through just before we eat a horse. That's, that's literally the way the horse sees it. It's a matter of life and death. Yeah. Yeah, and it's important to remember that, especially... It can seem more and more routine. Like if you, not that I've, I, I haven't gone to big ranches and started hundreds and hundreds of colts. But as I start more, I could see where there's potential to forget that. To forget how bothered they can be and, and how it is kind of a matter of life and death. Because... You know, it's it, it's what you do for a living. It's like, oh, here we go. We're going to start another cult. It's what we do every day. Um, and it, it's good to, like, have that level of competence, I think. But at least for me personally, sometimes, you know, it's like, okay, here we go. I'm going to sack him out, and then we're going to get this thing saddled. And if one's just happens to be a little touchier than the rest, it's like, well, why weren't you like the last 10 I just worked with? You know? But then you got to... Remember, it's like, well, he, you know, you know, um, if they're out there in like Central Asia being a wild horse, like this is the one that would live. Those other 10 would have gotten eaten by something. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So no, I, I just, I have to remind myself that because if you do it every day, it's like, well, look, buddy, you're the only one not getting with the program. So <laughs> let's go. <laughs> no, I, 
I, I've got so that I, every time I get to a new one, and it might not be a colt, it might just be a horse at one of these clinics that's having trouble. I go, I go at it with the um, attitude or idea, and it's real interesting. I think, I wonder what I'm going to learn from this one. I wonder what it's going to take from me to get my idea across to him what it is that I'd like for him to do without getting him in trouble or without getting him in too much trouble. You know, a young horse there, Ray used to say that sometimes they got to get in trouble to learn how to stay out of trouble. And sometimes they have to get a little bit afraid to learn they don't need to be afraid. Okay. But there's a, there's a line there where there's too much trouble. And at that point, you cross that line, that's when the horse, he's got to jerk loose from you or kick you down or buck you off or jump out of the trail or something. He said, I can't stand it anymore. So just before you cross that line, you back off. And he lets down a little bit, and you push back up toward that line again. So he, this time he's a little braver. So just before you cross the line, you back off. And by doing that over and over and over and over, you build his confidence for one day. You could just do anything with him, and he'd be all right about it. That's building confidence, building his confidence in you that you mean him no harm. But a lot of, a lot of folks don't see it that way. They just, they want him to do this and do that. They want him to go win the prize. He better do it. A lot of people seem like have a an entitlement mentality. You better do this for me and I deserve it because I buy the oats. The horse, he don't see it that way at all. Yeah, Joe and I, you know, we ride for the public and I think about it all the time how thankful I am to have their horses as a resource and like I'm lucky to ride their knothead every day Cause I, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have all those different horses to ride it's like a paid for education exactly and uh, I ought to pay them sometimes <laughs> those, but uh, those, uh, it's quite a thing it's quite a thing I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have all those different horses to ride, because it makes a huge difference. Even sometimes just screwing up on one, and I hate saying that, but yeah, you screw up on one, and then you get to try it over on a different one. And maybe you do patch things up on that other one, but next time you might try to do it a little better without screwing up first. And just even that, just having horses coming through. And uh, I mean, it would have been great to be in a position to ride thousands, but... Um, I'm happy to ride five or six different ones every month at least. Yeah, see, that's a good thing about those customer horses. You get to experiment. You know, if this experiment goes to hell, you just send him home. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll edit that part out. Try to maintain our clientele here, Buster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you, yeah. That, that's what I was saying earlier. The more horses you ride, the more opportunities you get to learn something because all those horses are going to be different and they all need a little something different from the human to get this job done that you're going to do whatever it might be and that's to me that's the interesting part is to figure out you know, what how can i get my idea across to this particular horse what we need to get on here and i know it'll work but it's up to me for it to work it's not up to him he didn't ask to be here anyway I mean, I, I've, I, I've thought about this a good deal. This way of working with horses works. And it works every time with every horse, given the opportunity and the time. And I believe it works because it's based on biblical principles. You know, give it some thought. That's the reason it works. You know, God gave us the horse so we don't have to walk like the rest of them people. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah, there are there are some profound uh, profound similarities between horsemanship and faith. Well, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Book of Proverbs, it says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Same thing with a colt. 
You get it right there early. You get that foundation in there right. See? When he's old, he just, he's good. They don't have any trouble. It's that, 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 the more this I do, the more I see how important those firsts are. The first time you catch one, the first time you're haltering, the first saddling, the first ride, the first week, the first 30 days, that lays the foundation for the rest of your life. So you put that stuff in there right, it never goes away. But you put it in there wrong, that never goes away either. And it's a lot, a lot more work and can be dangerous to, to change those things that shouldn't have been in there to start with. And like I say, sometimes you make a mistake and you mess up, now you got to go back and fix it. It's a, it's a lot harder to fix than it would have been just to get it in there right to start with. But a person's got to, got to learn that. If, you, if you've never made a mistake because you ain't been doing nothing, but you're supposed to learn from them mistakes. And uh, I, in fact, I was, I was going to Tennessee one time and I'd, I'd met a guy there the year before at the clinic. He's a cowboy kind of guy. Him and his brothers run a pretty big bunch of cattle. And so he told me, he said, if you ever back in this part of the country start colts, he said, I'd like to come watch or come help or something. So I called him and he came down there the first day and he was pretty excited to be there. And, and we didn't have a dozen or so colts to start. And he said, boy, he said, as much of this as you've done, how often you make a mistake nowadays? I said, every day on every horse. It might be a tiny, minute thing, but and but maybe nobody but you and the horse saw or felt it. But you'll see, well, I was a half a second too late there. I should have waited a little longer. I should have been just a little firmer. Oh, I should have released just a half a second earlier. All those tiny, minute things that you and the horse feel, nobody else would even notice. But you know, or you should know. So yeah, I, I make a lot of mistakes. Buster, I, that just reminded me of something I heard Buck say one time in a clinic. And he said, I always tell folks, you know, if you don't believe in God, just start working with horses and then come back and talk to me. Yeah. That yeah. is. Horses have, I mean, it's strengthened my faith 100%. Because the, the, the little I know and the more that I see as I grow up, you know, um, all of life has an order kind of laced through it, a God-centric order. But the horse is, is I feel very privileged to get to work with horses because you see that at work every day. And just the way that it's, it's fair and it's, it's clear and there's an order. And it matches a lot of other things in your life that are very similar. And, and the horse is so pure. You know, they don't have hatred or lust or jealousy or greed. They're just sort of a an innocent ambassador of this this order. Yeah, the horse is, is very honest. He has no agenda. Uh, that's a lot of people have trouble uh, when they're having when they're having some trouble with a horse, getting a horse to do something or understand something. Uh, they take it personally. He's trying to put something over on me. You know, he's cheating on me or something. But the horse, he don't see it that way at all. Now, we can teach him to cheat by not filling in the blanks for him. When you don't know what he's supposed to do and you can't help him, then he might learn to do something that you didn't really want him to do. But that's, that comes from the human, not the horse. Absolutely. I, I, doubt, I doubt that if you're serious about horses, I doubt that we'd ever learn as much about ourselves if it weren't for horses. Yeah. So that, yeah. That, that no matter horse, how painful that process might be. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the horse. He's a pretty good mirror. Yeah. You know, I, I heard a guy say one time, a friend of mine. He said, uh, "If you really want to know what's going on with a horse, said you get off, and you go right around in front of him, and you look right up in one of them big brown eyes, and what you'll see is a reflection of you." Hmm. So, what's out there on the horizon for you right now? Any 
big plans or things you want to do with horses in well, your future? Yeah, I've got a deal coming up as soon as I get home. I, I want to do this for a number of years, but I, I'm doing a coke starting clinic just for cowboys. Uh, you know, guys that make their living horseback. I've been wanting to do this for a number of years, but I, I a lot of young guys, and I, I get the day work around a little bit when I'm at home, and well, there's some, there's some really good young hands out there, and some of them are really close to getting along really good with horses and making some really good horses. But the younger guys, they never got to see Ray or be around him. And, and I'm not saying I'm Ray Hunt, there's no way. But if I could share with them some of the things that I saw Ray do and talk about, and that's where I feel pretty fortunate. And I think Buck will tell you the same thing. We met Ray at a time when he was physically able to show you these things. And, uh, you know, later years, he got to where he couldn't get in the air and he couldn't, couldn't do much. But I got to see him do some things that was remarkable, to say the least. So if I could get a chance to share that with some guys that could go and put it to use, and, and I saw what it, what a difference it made in uh, my cowboy and when I was first learned it and getting along with everyone. They're, they're in a they're in a position to make some outstanding horses, and, and of course we're raising more good prospects now than ever in the history of the world. So these these horses nowadays, gee, they're such good disposition and so athletic. And if you just set up and hold the bridle reins, leave them alone, they make pretty good horses. But most people can't leave them alone; they got to train them a little bit. Well, that that'll be cool, man. That'll be. Uh really special i'm sure I, i'm sure it'll mean a lot to you helping guys that are in the position now that you are in well be really know, we, got, we, we got a few signed up i don't know how many will come uh speaking from my own experience cowboys can be a little hard-headed when it comes to horses <laughs> i tell you i tell you go on our website and click on the Cowboy Coat College page and read what I wrote about it. I, I might have uh, baited the trap just a little. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that that's a good plug for everybody listening. Um, check out Buster McCleary. Check out his website. Um, check, check out the Cowboy Coat College. But um, Buster, this has been really fun. Uh, I, I know you knew Ben prior to this, but um, didn't know me from Adam, so I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with us. It's been great, and we'll have to have you back on for some more uh, some more punchy stories later. Well, I appreciate y'all having me. I mean, you young guys know about all this technology and, and a lot of connections. You you could have somebody famous on here besides listening to me, but I... Uh, I consider it a great uh, honor to get the opportunity to visit with horses, visit with people about horses, whether it's uh, on this deal or, or going to a clinic. Like I say, I just, I feel like I owe the horse so much for not, not only for what I've done to him, but for what he's done to me, for me, and he's done for my family. Uh, yeah, I've had horses do things for me that, most people couldn't believe it is like I say the country where I live is rough and brushy and rocky and everything grows got thorns on it. it it is amazing how a horse will abuse himself physically just because he knows he's got a job to do you you can't believe where a horse can go and I, I've come in hundreds of times blood running out of all four legs and maybe some other places too from all the rocks and brush and thorns you catch him again the next day, he said, you bet, let's go. The, the horse the horse will literally give you his life. You can ride a horse to death. I've, I've come pretty close time to a uh, mule, he'll quit you. Dog, you make it hard on a dog, you just crawl on the fence and go ties. And your best friend, you just put him out there on a pair of post hole diggers on the side of a rocky hill and just keep telling him to dig post holes. If he don't stab you in the back. Eventually, you'll look out there and them post holders will just be, post holders, they'll just be standing there by themselves. And you'll call him on the phone, and that phone will just ring and ring and ring. 
He'll quit you when he's had enough. Not the horse. He'll give it everything he's got, every time. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, everybody, that was episode 36 of On the Move with Buster McClory. Buster, thank you again. We'll have, have you back next time. All right, Joe. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And next time I wear my cowboy hat, so I look like cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me, man. Thanks.